EAA's webinars are made possible through the generous support of Aircraft Spruce and Specialty, serving home builders and EAA members since 1965. Tonight's presentation is titled Turbocharging Systems. Our presenter is Mike Bush. Mike is president of Savvy Aviation. He's author for numerous aviation publications over, over many years. Uh, holds a certified flight instructor certificate, uh, AMP mechanic certificate with inspection authorization privileges, and uh, 2008 uh, Aviation Maintenance Technician of the Year and a member of EAA. Mike, thanks for being with us tonight. I'm going to turn control the presentation over to you. Thank you, Tim. Hi, everybody. Uh, I am coming to you tonight from my uh, embassy suites room in uh, Denver, Colorado. Uh, I just flew here yesterday in my Cessna 310 for a, a business meeting and uh, it's the uh, first part of a, a month-long trip that I'm going to be making around the country in my airplane, uh, pretty much all of October. Um, at any rate, the subject for tonight, um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about turbocharging systems, um, both uh, a little technical stuff about how they work and also some subjective stuff about uh, my experience um, with, with them. Um, I learned to fly on the East Coast in the mid-1960s. I dug this photograph out of an archive. This is me sitting behind a rental Cherokee 140 in 1967 in some nameless place in New Jersey. Um, but when I was learning to fly in the 60s, um, turbocharging uh, was, uh, was basically a dirty word. Everyone uh, said that turbos were bad news. They were expensive, they were inefficient, they were very maintenance intensive, problem prone, they shortened the TBO of engines. And basically they were only justified if you were operating out of high altitude airports. And uh, learning to fly back on the East Coast, we really didn't have any high altitude airports. So um, I uh, kind of came of age in aviation believing that turbocharging was, uh, was, was not a good thing. And the first 20 years of, of my flying experience was uh, all in normally aspirated general aviation airplanes. Uh, I flew rental airplanes, of course, when I was training in 1968. When I was 24 years old, I bought my first airplane. It was a Cessna 182. Uh, a few years later, I felt the need for speed and I sold a 182 and bought a, a, a Blanca Super Viking. Um, flew the Super Viking for a number of years, uh, sold it, uh, uh, flew various uh, rented high performance piston singles, Bonanza, Cessna 210s, but they were all normally aspirated airplanes. And uh, that was pretty much my whole exposure. Uh, to GA, piston GA was normally aspirated airplanes for about the first 20 years that I was flying. And then in 1967, um, I bought my first uh, turbocharged airplane, uh, a 1979 Cessna Turbo 310, which is the airplane that I am still flying today, some 30 odd years later, 31 years later. And it's the airplane that I flew to Denver from California yesterday. Um, and when I bought the airplane, it was not only my first turbocharged airplane, it's my first twin engine airplane. And uh, I was uh, I was frankly uh, pretty concerned that uh, it would turn out to be a lemon and a maintenance hog and uh, that I was making a big mistake. And, uh, and I promised myself that if it did turn out to uh, to be a problem child, I would I would sell it and, and buy something. Uh, a simpler and uh, normally aspirated. Well, as it turned out over the next 30 years, um, that uh, this turbocharged twin Cessna, Cessna 310 proved to be not only a great airplane, but the most reliable and trouble-free airplane I've ever owned. And, and just a fantastic traveling machine. And I travel all over the country in it. I make multiple transcontinental trips every year in the airplane. And as a result of three decades of experience uh, flying turbocharged, my attitude about turbocharging 
has made a 180 degree reversal to what it was um, and what I was led to believe when I uh, when I first entered uh, the, 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 the GA arena. Um, so much so that, uh, that today, knowing what I know now, I would never again consider purchase, purchasing a normally uh, non-turbocharged airplane, normally aspirated airplane, unless it was something purely recreational like an LSA or a float plane or something. But, but if it was an airplane that I was actually going to use to go from point A to point B, which is pretty much the way I use an airplane, um, I, I, I would never uh, buy a, uh, a normally aspirated airplane. I would always buy a turbocharged airplane. If I didn't own the 310 today and I was looking to buy an airplane, I wouldn't buy a twin. I would buy a, a single, but it would definitely be turbocharged. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the wh why I love turbocharging, why I've become a turbocharging bigot, if you will. <laughs> Uh, the top four reasons why I love turbocharging. And I've tried to, in David Letterman fashion, I've tried to try to rank these. The, the number one thing that I love about turbocharging is that it, it keeps me out of the ice. Um, I fly pretty much an all weather operation. You know, I'm here in Denver today, tomorrow I have to fly to, to uh, Southern uh, Illinois for the AOPA regional fly-in. And, and it's not a question of if I'm going to fly. I mean, I have to fly. I have to be there. I'm, I'm giving an all-day day seminar on Friday. So um, uh, I operate my airplane pretty much the way the, the, way the airlines operate. I, I, I have to fly. It's not a question of whether I'm going to get there. It's only a question of if I'm going to take some circuitous route around the weather. But ice is a big problem, especially as it's getting towards winter. And I so distinctly remember all the years that I was flying normally aspirated airplanes, um, struggling with ice. My, my, the scariest experiences I had flying uh, in my early years uh, of GA were, were ice issues. Um, I, especially out west, I'd be stuck between uh, the MEA, I couldn't go lower then, and the freezing level, and I couldn't go higher then. And it was very uncomfortable. And uh, and I and I had some quite memorable experiences with ice. Um, the turbocharging basically solves that problem. I mean, I, I the, my Cessna 310 is known icing equipped, and it does have boots and hot props and hot windshield and all that stuff. But I hardly ever use any of that icing gear because turbocharging is the best the icing gear there is. There's virtually always some ice-free altitude available when you have a turbocharged aircraft because you pretty much have a choice of, of of any altitude from the MEA up into the low flight levels. And normally icing only takes place in a fairly thin layer, a couple thousand feet thick. And if you can't get below it, you can get above it uh, in a turbocharged airplane. So it, it pretty much makes ice a non-problem. Um, and and it's, it, it really is very marvelous that way. And that's probably the biggest thing about turbocharging that, th that the biggest thing that changed for me when I went from normally aspirated to turbocharge. It solved the icing problem, which was a really big problem. Probably the second reason I love turbocharging is it's it's it solves to a large extent the turbulence problem. Uh, turbulence is exhausting, uh, especially when you're making a long trip. It frightens passengers, um, and if the turbulence is sufficiently great, it can be a threat to flight safety. Again, with turbocharging, you have a much wider range of altitudes that you can choose. And it's almost always possible to find a smooth altitude. Um, it's typically a lot smoother up high rather than down low. And even if it's if you have convective weather, um, turbocharging isn't usually high enough to get over thunderstorms. But it's normally, uh, it normally lets you get high enough to see and avoid thunderstorms visually. Um, rather than 
plowing through clouds and hoping that your next rad display is uh, is is going to keep you out of trouble. Um, so uh, it's 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 just a real boon um, when when it's turbulent out or when there's convective weather. The third reason is the need for speed. Um, uh, normally aspirated airplanes typically operate most efficiently around 8,000 feet MSL or so. And as you climb higher than that, they get slower and slower. Uh, turbocharged airplanes keep going faster and faster as they climb higher up to what's called their critical altitude, which for most turbocharged piston airplanes is somewhere between 16,000 and 24,000 feet MSL. Um, so basically, the higher you go, the faster you go. Now, that's not necessarily the the boon that that you might think, because the higher you go, also the stronger the winds aloft. So, if the winds aloft are favorable, um, climbing high is absolutely wonderful because not only does the airplane fly faster, but you get a a, a, a a stronger tailwind and you know my airplane up at altitude will do in the around 200 knots true but i've seen 300 knots on ground speed on occasion and that's that's really quite a quite cool going up high and picking up a really good tailwind uh, particularly in the winter of course um there's no free lunch in aviation and so if the winds are not favorable um flying higher you're flying into stronger headwinds um but generally speaking most of the time what i find is that as you climb higher at least within limits the increase in true airspeed as you go higher pretty much offsets the increase in headwind and um and going up higher gives you a smoother ride so um i almost always go up high when I'm flying westbound because the winds are typically on my tail. I often fly up high going eastbound, even though the winds are on my nose because the airplane's going faster and it, it kind of counter counterbalances the, uh, the increased headwind. Um, so uh, turbocharged airplane compared to normally aspirated airplane um, might be five knots faster at, 12 or 13,000 feet. Um, if you are willing to put an oxygen cannula on, which I, and I have a, just a flip down cannula that's mounted on my headset, so going on oxygen takes me about 15 seconds. Um, up high, the, the airplane goes 25 knots faster. And if I have a tailwind, it can go a whole lot faster than that. So this, I, I like the speed of turbocharging. And, and the last reason I like it, and I put it last, uh, even though it's what most people think of as first, is that it's very helpful when you're operating out of high altitude airports. Um, uh, it, basically, you have 100% takeoff power regardless of field elevation. They still use more runway um, uh, be, because uh, uh, the, uh, the airplane uses more runway when the density altitude is higher but but you you have a hundred percent power you have a hundred percent climb capability and it's uh, it's really really very reassuring when you're flying up up high and you know coming out here i i made a fuel stop in utah at a fuel elevation of close to seven thousand feet and here in denver it was fifty five hundred feet um and it's have, having the turbo is nice, but it's it's certainly not at the top of my list of why uh, turbos are beneficial. It's it's a nice thing to have, but to me the real big thing is being able to be out of the ice and the bumps and and getting a little bit and getting some some extra uh, cruise airspeed. So what about all of these downsides of turbocharging? Everybody always told me about when I was learning to fly. Um, well, let's take a look at those. Um, one thing is shorter TBO. Um, I don't believe it. My experience is quite the opposite. I, the, the engine in my airplane is a TSA 0520, two of them. Um, uh, 
that Continental has placed a laughably short TBO of 1,400 hours on it. That same engine without the turbocharger has a TBO of 1,700 hours. So according to Continental, my TBO is 300 hours shorter than it would be without the turbocharger. Um, but my actual experience is totally different than that. Uh, the right engine my airplane it went to 3,200 hours before I overhauled it. And the left engine passed 3,200 hours and is still is still trucking. Um, so uh, you've heard me talk about TBO before, probably, and I, I don't. I'm not a big believer in TBO. But if the turbochargers shorten the life of the engines, I sure am not seeing it. Um, now, you know, I'm I'm careful about uh, uh, about how I operate the engines. I'm pretty obsessive about temperature control. I treat 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 the turbochargers very well, and I think that's important. Um, but if you if you give it a little effort, um, uh, tur turbocharged engines can be very reliable and very long lived. And I think uh, my experience is uh, uh, demonstrates the uh, the truth of that. Now, um, turbochargers typically, the turbocharger itself will typically not not go to TBO. Um, uh, according to my turbocharger overhaul shop friends, uh, most people get about a thousand hours out of a turbo. And so if the engine is a 2,000 hour engine, they'll have to change the turbo once at mid-engine TBO. Um, I've done better than that. I typically get about 1,500 hours uh, out of a turbocharger. But again, since I took my, my engines to over 3,000 hours, I've, I've had to do uh, intermediate turbocharger changes, but not very often. Um, you know, getting 1,000 or 1,500 hours out of a turbo is, is, uh, is, is pretty reasonable as far as I'm concerned. And the, the, replacing a turbo is not that big a deal. Uh, it's, it's not it's not as expensive as changing a cylinder, for example. It's, it's, it's just not a life changing event. Um, how about the, uh, the business about the uh, maintenance being more expensive? Well, it's true that the, that the turbocharged engines do require more maintenance. The exhaust systems require a bit more maintenance. The turbochargers will often require uh, overhaul at mid TBO, but, when you add up what that costs, it turns out to be very little. It's really chump change. Um, I, I did a worst case analysis um, uh, based on worst case assumptions like thousand hour life out of a turbocharger, which I've done better than that. And, um, and assuming a, a fair amount of exhaust system maintenance and so on. And when I add up all of the additional expenses in terms of maintenance and also in terms of operating cost because there is some operating cost increase of operating a turbo. It, it comes to less than $10 an hour uh, per engine. And for a, a high performance single that you know, costs $200 an hour or so to operate, $10 an hour is not a very significant penalty considering all the benefits that you get. So I don't really buy the more expensive argument. There's some truth to it, but but very little. Um, what about inefficient? Well, again, there, there's some truth to it, but it's not really what you think. A turbocharged engine, um, uh, especially if it's turbo boosted, it it has a lower compression ratio. Most turbocharged engines have a seven and a half to one compression ratio rather than eight and a half to one compression ratio, which means that they use a little bit more fuel than a comparable uh, normally aspirated engine, maybe not another gallon an hour or so. Um, but the, with that extra fuel burn, they, they yield a significantly faster cruise speed you know, five to 25 knots faster, depending on what, how high you go up, the higher you go, the more the, the cruise speed increases. So the only way that a turbocharged airplane is less efficient than normally aspirated airplane is if you compared them both operating at the same altitude, like 8,000 feet. Um, normally aspirated airplanes like to operate at 8,000 feet. Turbocharged airplanes don't like to operate at 8,000 feet. They like to operate at you know, anywhere between 
twelve and twenty two thousand feet um, and so if you if you compare normally aspirated and turbocharged and fly them each at the altitude that they that that they are happiest at uh, the turbocharged airplane will beat the normally aspirated airplane every time in terms of efficiency if you compare them at the same altitude then the normally aspirated airplane is is more efficient um, but I don't think that's really a fair comparison because that artificially causes the turbocharged airplane to be flying down at a lower altitude than than, than it's happy flying at so um, any rate given all of the that I, what I've just told you what why do turbochargers have such a bad reputation well um, there are a couple of reasons um, first of all, turbocharged engines are more vulnerable to abuse, especially in the hands of a ham-fisted pilot. Um, you do need to be a little careful. You, you don't want to jam the throttle forward fast or, or make rapid power reductions, or, and you want to be careful about temperature control, and you want to be careful about your leaning. Um, it's, it's just easier to abuse a turbocharged engine if you aren't careful with how you operate it. So, you know, I wouldn't particularly recommend um, buying a turbocharged airplane to put on a rental line <laughs> or to use for flight training. Um, but if it's an airplane you're going to be using yourself and, and you're, you know, you, you discipline yourself to operate the thing responsibly, um, you know, I think my experience shows that you can that you can do it at, at very modest maintenance costs and uh, with very good longevity. Um, there are some problem prone turbocharged engines that kind of give turbocharging a bad name. Um, there are some very highly boosted engines. I, I generally have a rule of thumb that, that says uh, um, direct drive piston aircraft engines don't like to put out more than about six tenths of a horsepower per cubic inch. And so if you if 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 you boost a, a, a turbocharged engine so that it puts out a lot more horsepower than that, it's probably going to have longevity problems. Uh, you know, one example of that is uh, that there's a picture of it to the right is a is the is the Cessna pressurized Skymaster, which has a a, a pair of um, Continental uh, TSIO 360 engines um, that are rated at uh, 225 horsepower. And 225 horsepower is just more than you should be getting out of a 360 cubic inch engine. Um, the, the horsepower to cubic inch ratio of that, of that engine is uh, 0.625. And um, we, used to, we used to maintain a couple of these pressurized Skymasters. Um, in fact, Richard Bach, the famous author, uh, Jonathan, Jonathan Livingston Siegel, author, used to have a pressurized Skymaster, and he never got through an annual without changing a couple cylinders. Um, and it's just that that engine is being asked to put out more horsepower than 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 God intended a horse uh, an engine of that displacement to do. There are a couple of other engines in that category that that are that are highly boosted and, and, and can suffer longevity problems because of that. Um, there are some aircraft, uh, the Mooney 231, for example, is an, it comes to mind, that have a fixed wastegate. We'll be talking about how the wastegate system works in, in, uh, in just a little bit. Um, but in, instead of having a, an, an adjustable uh, automatic wastegate that regulates the speed of the turbocharger. It, it, it has a fixed wastegate. Um, Connell and Mooney decided to do that uh, because it was cheap and it saved money and it was a, a really bad idea and those engines don't do very well and uh, quite a few of them have been converted uh, with an aftermarket uh, automatic wastegate system which makes them much better engines but the, the fixed wastegate was not a good idea. There are some uh, STC conversions uh, that have manually controlled wastegates. They basically have a second throttle in the cockpit that controls the wastegate, and the wastegate controls the, the, the speed of the turbocharger. Uh, that's also not a, not a great idea because it's very, very easy to abuse those systems. Um, we've also seen a problem with aftermarket intercoolers. Um, 
uh, a lot of uh, turbocharged aircraft were not equipped with intercoolers or were equipped with small intercoolers. And some companies have come out with aftermarket intercoolers that can be added on as, as alterations. Um, the problem is that when you put an, uh, an intercooler on a turbocharged engine and, and you, you cool down the, the induction air, you increase the engine's horsepower. And so um, unless the intercooler manufacturers provided data for adjusting the power charts, and a lot of them have not done that, uh, people will put on an aftermarket intercooler and then run the engines way harder than, than, than they should be run and, uh, and have longevity problems that way. So there, there have been some problem-prone things that, that, that tend to become uh, war stories that give turbocharging a bad name. But if you if you avoid those relatively you know, few uh, bad apples, um, uh, by and large, turbocharged airplanes can uh, have the potential of being uh, very very reliable and very reasonable in terms of maintenance cost. So the bottom line is, if you use your airplane as a serious all weather traveling machine the way I do, uh, you will benefit without question greatly from turbocharging. And if you manage your turbocharged power plant with a little bit of tender loving care, avoid engines that are known to be problematic, um, you'll wind up loving uh, uh, turbos as much as I do. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how turbocharging works, how the systems work. Um, uh, this is a typical aircraft turbocharger, and uh, uh, the turbocharger uh, basically consists of, of, of three sections. Um, on the left is the compressor, um, which is the cold section of the turbocharger. Um, on the right is the turbine, the hot section. Uh, turbocharger takes exhaust gas and puts it through a turbine and spins a compressor and compresses uh, induction air uh, to increase manifold pressure of the engine uh, to at least um, sea level pressure and, may, and sometimes higher than sea level pressure at, even at high altitudes. In between the the turbine section and the compressor section is a, is a center section that has some very high speed bearings and a bunch of oil um, fittings to, 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 to pump oil through the center section and keep it lubricated uh, because the, the turbochargers spin very fast you know, 50, 75,000, even higher RPM. They, they, they spin very rapidly and the, the bearings are kind of special and they need a lot of oil. And so that's what goes, the center section is just, is just basically the bearing that, uh, in which the shaft rotates, the shaft that couples the, uh, uh, the turbine to the compressor. And that's basically all there is to a turbocharger itself. But the turbocharger is part of, of, of a, more complete system called a turbo system. Uh, here's a, a simplified schematic of a, of a typical turbo system, and we'll talk just for a second about how it works. Um, um, ambient air uh, enters the, 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 uh, the engine um, through the compressor section. Uh, the compressor compresses that air up to um, higher than ambient pressure. Uh, normally it, it, it compresses the air to at least sea level pressure, 30 inches or so, uh, and sometimes uh, considerably more than sea level pressure depending on the design of the system. Uh, if, if the compressor only compresses the air to sea level pressure, uh, we call it a turbo normalized system. Uh, it's just an engine that thinks it's at sea level even when it's much higher than sea level. Uh, if it boosts the uh, pressure higher than, than than sea level pressure, we call it a tur turbo boosted system. Um, but at any rate, the, the this compressed air uh, goes through uh, the induction manifold through the throttle body, where where it goes through a throttle butterfly that's con uh, that's uh, connected to the cockpit throttle control. Um, there is an overboost. Um, control valve um, that uh, that will relieve excess pressure if for some reason the turbocharger runs away and the and the compressor compresses air to a higher pressure than it's than it's supposed to the uh, 
overbose control valve will uh, will protect the system from damage, but normally it, the the valve stays closed all the time. Um, and so this compressed air it goes through the th the the throttle and uh, and into the induction uh, the intake port of the uh, of the cylinders. Now, just as a matter of terminology, um, most of us are familiar with the concept of manifold pressure, which is the the pressure in the in in the intake manifold that leads to the uh, uh, to the cylinder's intake ports. We normally have a manifold pressure gauge on the panel. Um, in turbocharged system, we also have something called upper deck pressure. Upper deck pressure, which is can also be called compressor discharge pressure, but it's the it's the pressure that in the system that comes out of the compressor before uh, it goes through the throttle, and the manifold pressure. Is, is the pressure after it goes through the, the throttle. If the throttle is wide open, um, then manifold pressure is very close to upper deck pressure, maybe just a little bit less because there are some, some inevitable uh, losses going through the throttle body. As you close the throttle, um, the, the, uh, the difference between upper deck pressure and, and manifold pressure increases. The upper deck pressure stays high. The manifold pressure is reduced because you're choking it off of the throttle. So that's just terminology, upper deck pressure versus manifold pressure. So this compressed air goes into the uh, intake ports of the cylinders and gets combined with, uh, with fuel and combustion occurs. Now, most turbocharged engines are, are fuel injected. Uh, a few turbocharged engines are carbureted. Uh, the turbocharged uh, Cessna 182 is a good example of a of, of a airplane that has a carbureted turbocharged engine. It's it's uh, it's got a Lycoming uh, 0540 carbureted engine, it, uh, and Cessna just strapped a turbocharger in front of it and pumps pressurized air into the carb. That's um, not too usual. Most turbocharged engines are, are fuel injected. But at any rate, the combustion event occurs and uh, a bunch of hot exhaust gas uh, comes out of the exhaust port of the cylinder. And in a normally aspirated engine, all that exhaust gas just gets dumped overboard uh, via the tailpipe. But in a turbocharged engine, um, we use some of that exhaust gas uh, to drive the turbine. Um, and so the exhaust gas actually has two paths that it can escape. One is by going through the turbine, and the other is by going through the wastegate. The wastegate is uh, is just a, a, a butterfly valve, kind of like the throttle, except it, it is designed to operate under very high temperature. And if the wastegate is open, um, then it lets the exhaust gas freely pass out uh, without ha without going through the turbo the turbine, if the wastegate is closed, it it forces all of the exhaust gas to go through the turbine, and if it's partially open, it it kind of splits the exhaust gas into two sections. Some some goes out the wastegate, some drives the turbine. So by adjusting the position of the wastegate, we can determine how much exhaust gas goes through the turbine, and how fast the turbine spins, and therefore how fast the compressor spins. Um, now, the idea of the system is that we want the compressor to spin fast enough to generate whatever upper deck pressure we're looking for. In a turbo normalized system, for example, we're looking for around 30, 32 inches of upper deck pressure. So we want to spin the, the compressor fast enough to generate that amount of pressure. If we're down at sea level, we, we don't have to hardly spin it at all. If we're up at at flight level 180, we've got to spin it really fast to, 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 to compress the air up to that point because the ambient air is half the pressure, uh, half sea level pressure, and we've got to pump it all the way up to, to full sea level pressure. So we've got to spin the compressor real fast. So the way we regulate the speed of the compressor is by varying the amount of exhaust gas that goes through the turbine, and we do that by opening and closing the wastegate. And there's an automatic control system on most of these engines. Um, I mentioned that there are a couple of engines where they don't use an automatic control system, and those are typically quite problematic engines, and I don't really recommend them. But the automatic control system has two uh, components. It's, there, there's uh, something called a controller, 
and something called a wastegate assembly. The wastegate assembly actually contains two parts. The wastegate itself, which is this high temperature butterfly valve uh, on the right side, and a hydraulic actuator that opens and closes the, uh, the wastegate. Uh, it's driven by engine oil, and that's the, the cylinder on the left. And those two together, the actuator and the wastegate, are called the wastegate assembly. Um, so the way this and, and the, the way it works is the 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 wastegate is spring loaded. There's a big spring there to the wide open position. Uh, the wide open position means m means all the air, all all the exhaust is all the exhaust is going to go through out the wastegate, and very little of it is going to go through the through the turbine. Um, and it's driven to a closed position um, by the actuator by oil pressure. So by varying the oil pressure in the actuator, we can open and close this wastegate and vary how much exhaust uh, goes through the turbine and therefore how fast the, the compressor spins. Um, so again, the, the wastegate is spring-loaded open, which is no boost, and is closed by oil pressure, which would be maximum boost. Um, and, the, and, and this is controlled by the controller, and the controller is a, is a pretty well, the simplest controller, the one that I'm showing here called an absolute pressure controller, is actually a very simple device. It, it contains an aneroid, which um, measures upper deck pressure, and a poppet valve, which regulates the, um, the, the oil flow out of the wastegate actuator. Engine oil is pumped into the wastegate actuator, and controller varies um, uh, the flow of oil out of the wastegate actuator with this aneroid driven poppet valve. So if the valve is open, oil is let out of the actuator, the spring drives the wastegate to wide open, and the turbine slows down. On the other hand, if the poppet valve closes, um, it, it uh, prevents oil from escaping from the wastegate actuator. The, so pressure builds up in the wastegate actuator, closes the, the, the wastegate butterfly, and forces more and more exhaust through the turbine, and the compressor spins faster. And so the, we've got a, a closed feedback system here, where, where the, the, this aneroid and poppet valve in the controller will keep varying the wastegate position uh, to maintain um, the level of upper deck air that the uh, that the controller is designed to to maintain, an absolute pressure controller. There's a screwdriver adjustment on it, and you set it to whatever uh, upper deck pressure you want for the system. And in my airplane, it's about 32 inches, and it's ground adjustable by a mechanic uh, to to provide that uh, level of upper deck pressure. Now, the absolute pressure controller is the simplest kind of turbo controller. There are various other kinds of controllers that are used of various varying sophistication. Um, one of the problems with the absolute pressure controller is that as you climb higher and higher um, and the outside pressure is lower and lower, the controller will command more and more boost and spin the turbocharger faster and faster. And that's what it's supposed to do. But the problem is that if you go high enough, it will spin the turbocharger fast enough that it will actually start damaging the turbocharger. The turbocharger basically has a, an RPM red line, if you will, uh, that, it, that shouldn't be spun any faster than a, certain, uh, than a certain speed. Otherwise, centrifugal forces on those very, very hot turbine blades can cause the blades to stretch and start rubbing on the turbine housing and bad things happen. So one solution to that problem is to add a pressure ratio controller. Um, and my airplane has both an absolute pressure controller and a pressure ratio controller. The pressure ratio controller doesn't do anything until you get high enough that the, tur the turbocharger is spinning at maximum sp allowable speed. And then as you climb higher than that, the pressure ratio controller um, takes over and prevents the, uh, the the turbocharger from spinning any faster. So it limits the pressure ratio, which is the ratio between uh, 
um, b between the ambient air going into the compressor and the upper deck pressure coming out of the compressor. So for example, um, uh, if the pressure ratio controller were set to maintain a maximum pressure ratio of two to one, then when you climb the airplane up to 18,000 feet, there would be a two to one ratio because outside uh, pressure is half sea level pressure. And if you climbed higher than 18,000 feet, the pressure ratio controller would prevent the, uh, um, the uh, upper deck pressure from con continuing to maintain its, its sea level value and overspeeding the turbocharger. Um, another approach to this is something called a variable absolute pressure controller or VAPC. Uh, a VAPC is just like an absolute pressure controller, except that the set point of the controller, instead of being a screwdriver adjustable thing that the mechanic sets, is actually connected to a cam that's connected to the throttle control in the cockpit. So as you change throttle position, it tells the controller to, as you throttle back, it tells the controller to reduce um, upper deck pressure. and um, uh, so in airplanes like that, th there's typically a placard that says above a certain altitude, uh, you need to start throttling back to protect the turbocharger. Um, the verbal absolute pressure controller uh, is used in quite, quite a few airplanes, but it requires a kind of complicated mechanical linkage because uh, the throttle control is now driving both the, th the throttle uh, butterfly in the throttle body and also the controller uh, cam. So there's another uh, way of skinning that cat called a differential slope controller. And a differential slope controller not only has an aneroid that looks at um, upper deck pressure, but it also has another reference line that looks at manifold pressure. And so when you throttle back and manifold pressure drops below upper deck pressure, the controller says, aha, the pilot doesn't want all of this upper deck pressure. I'm, I'm going to, uh, I'm, I'm going to back it off some. So it's just a different way of allowing the pilot to control upper deck pressure um, using a pneumatic system as opposed to using a mechanical system. And finally, there's something called a density controller, which is used in some like aircraft like Piper Navajos, which actually uh, calculates air density uh, and, and is sensitive to temperature changes and stuff. It's pretty sophisticated and expensive, and it's typically only used in very, very highly boosted engines. Um, but uh, these are all kind of variations on the controller, but they all pretty much do the same thing. They, 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 they watch upper deck pressure, and in some cases they watch manifold pressure, and then they that they open and close a poppet valve, which controls the, the wastegate actuator, which opens and closes the wastegate, and that controls the speed of the turbocharger. Hopefully, everybody followed all of that. Um, as I mentioned, we, we sort of classify turbo systems into two broad categories, ones that, that boost, that, that maintain sea level pressure up at altitude. They're called turbo, turbo normalized engines, and ones that, um, use turbocharging as a um, to, to increase um, sea level po uh, power called turbo boosted uh, engines. And um, the turbo normalized engines will, will can typically use uh, the same eight and a half to one compression ratio as, uh, as normally aspirated engines. So uh, they get just as good fuel efficiency. Um, the turbo boosted engines normally use a seven and a half to one compression ratio to provide additional detonation margin. Um, so they, they get a somewhat less fuel efficiency than, uh, than turbo normalized ones uh, do. Um, in some airplanes, they use a pair of turbochargers, uh, one driven by the left bank of cylinders, one driven by the right bank of cylinders. Um, they, uh, the, these things typically, either use a, a, a single common wastegate that the two turbochargers share, or they, they use a pair of wastegates that are mechanically linked together and are controlled by a single actuator. 
Um, but there are quite a few airplanes that have twin turbocharger systems. The Piper Malibu and the Cirrus SR-22T uh, are, are examples of airplanes that use uh, twin turbochargers, and there are quite a few more. But uh, sometimes two small turbochargers are often easier to fit in the cowl uh, and, and way less than one, one big giant turbocharger. There are still a few mechanical supercharger systems left where, where a compressor is driven directly by the engine as opposed to an exhaust driven turbine. Um, the, the mechanical servo turbochargers were used a lot in the, in the old big radial warbird engines, um, but they're not used very much anymore. The problem with, one of the problems with the mechanical turbocharger is it, you can't control it. it. It it turns at a at a speed that's a function of engine speed, and and you don't have anything analogous to a a wastegate to speed it up or slow it down as as necessary. So uh, the turbocharger is um, is much more easily controllable, and so almost all um, modern um, supercharging systems are, are are turbochargers. And of course, that that's also true in automobiles. So, Tim, that's that's all I had in terms of prepared material, but I'd uh, be glad to open it for some Q&A. Okay, Mike. Hey, thanks a lot. Uh, good and interesting presentation there. Um, Brian's wondering, how does a turbocharger compare to a supercharged engine? Well, I just talked about that on the last slide. Uh, 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 supercharging refers to a mechanically driven supercharger, uh, 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 mechanically driven compressor, um, rather than a, a compressor that's driven by an exhaust turbine. And um, uh, it, it's a technology that was used a lot back in the World War II era. Uh, it's not used very often anymore. Um, and the main reason is that the mechanically driven turbocharger, uh, I mean, the me mechanically driven supercharger, um, uh, it, it doesn't have a control mechanism. It's, it's, it runs it, the, the compressor runs at a constant speed um, based on engine speed, and, and there isn't any way to, to vary it. And we really want the compressor to, compress a lot when we're up at high altitude and not to compress nearly as much when we're at low altitude. Um, and it's hard to do that with a, uh, with a mechanically driven supercharger. So that's why they've kind of fallen out of favor. Joe's wondering what is actually cooling down in the turbo when the manufacturer requires a six minute cool down? Well, first of all, the manufacturers don't ever require anything. There, there are some POH suggestions, but none of them are, are limitations of any sort. Um, the, 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 there's a lot of misinformation about turbo cool down and stuff. It, what, what, it, what really is, um, uh, it is important is the, the turbocharger spins at very high speed. Um, and it's what's important is to give it a chance to slow down, to spin down before you shut the engine down. Because when you shut the engine down, you shut off the oil pressure. And if the if the if the turbocharger is still spinning, uh, especially if it's spinning fast, and you shut off its oil supply, it's going to damage the center section of the turbocharger. So, what all that is really about is giving the turbocharger an adequate amount of time to to spin down to low rpm before you cut off its oil supply now most of the time um i mean if you think about it you you you, you throttle back on on final for landing uh, the turbocharger is already starting to spin down you do your landing roll this the turbocharger is spinning down while you're rolling out um, you, you, you taxi and usually you taxi at fairly low power and the turbocharger continues, continues, continues to spin down. So most of the time, by, by the time you reach your tie down or your hangar or wherever it is you're going to park the airplane, plenty of time has elapsed for the turbocharger to spin down and there's really no reason to sit there idling the engine. Um, but uh, 
you know, there are exceptions to that rule. If, if, if you land at a, on a short runway and you turn off at the end and you're right at your, at, at, at the parking spot, uh, you may have to give the, the turbine a little time to, to spin down. Um, or if you are taxiing into a really strong headwind or taxiing uphill or something where you're carrying um, more power than usual, you, you, again, you might need to give the turbocharger a little extra time to, to spin down when you reach the, your spot before you, before you pull the mixture. Um, but most of the time, you, you, the plenty of time elapses just under normal circumstances that you don't have to sit there idling. So a lot, a lot of people take those POH recommendations way too literally and they'll sit there, you know, uh, with the engines running for, you know, minutes and minutes on end for, for no good reason. And we've done quite a bit of instrumentation of, of, of turbochargers and, and uh, um, the, the doing that most of the time really accomplishes no, nothing particularly useful um, uh, with, the, with a couple of exceptions that, that I mentioned. Stan wonders, what is the typical failure mode with a turbocharger? Um, well, most of the time, uh, turbochargers don't fail outright. I mean, I'm, I've never in 30 years of flying that my 310 or 60 engine years, if you will, <laughs> ever had any kind of a catastrophic event with the turbocharger. Typically what happens is that a, at an inspection, you, you, you always um, open things up so that you can check the turbocharger and you're looking for things like, like uh, uh, turbine blade scrape and that sort of thing, or um, uh, cracks in the, in the flange where the, where the tailpipe uh, attaches, that sort of thing. And eventually the, the, the turbocharger will, will fail the test. Sometimes uh, it, you'll get some exhaust leakage in places that shouldn't be leaking and you'll say, I guess this thing is, is, is ready to, to be overhauled. Um, I have seen a, a few turbocharger failures, not my own airplane, but in other people's airplanes. Um, and the, the ones I've seen have mostly been infant mortality uh, failures where the turbocharger was overhauled and it, so it wasn't balanced quite right. And then when it got up to to high RPM uh, up at altitude, it, it, it just came apart. It bent the shaft and, and, and everything kind of jammed up. Um, but typically if, if the turbocharger, you know, survives the, the first 10 or 15 hours, it's probably going to, uh, it's probably going to give a pretty reasonable life. And the, the, the symptoms that will cause you to uh, remove it for overhaul are, are usually pretty benign symptoms, things that you find during an inspection, not things that happen to you in flight. At least that's my experience. Richard's wondering, are the turbochargers more sensitive than the engine to careful oil maintenance practices? Um, and, and here's a follow on from Dale that's related. How does turbocharging influence oil types? Well, let's see. I'm, I'm just trying to think of what the best thing to, to, to say about that is. Um, uh, there, we really don't change the choice of oil based on whether the engine is turbocharged or not. Um, the, we, the, 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 the turbocharger center section is, is, is a pretty hot place. Um, we, we have to pump a bunch of oil through it and the oil gets all foamed up as it's going through the turbocharger because the shaft is spinning so fast and, um, the turbochargers actually have a second oil pump called a scavenge pump, uh, that sucks oil out of the turbocharger because, um, uh, if, if we just pumped oil into the turbocharger and didn't uh, actively suck it back out, uh, we'd wind up getting oil in the, in the hot section of the turbocharger and, and uh, um, put a lot of black smoke out the exhaust and stuff like that. Um, 
there are some things in the turbocharger oil system that sometimes are problematic. Some of the systems have have check valves uh, that, uh, and if the check valves aren't working properly, the the the, the turbocharger will leak oil and stuff like that. Um, it, um, my airplane doesn't have any check check valves because of where the turbocharger is mounted. But if the turbocharger is uh, uh, is mounted down below the engine, uh, the, typically are check valves in the system. Uh, but as far as choice of oil is concerned, we, we don't really use any different kind of oil in turbocharged engines than, than we use in normally aspirated engines. Okay, Stephen is uh, saying, I live near the East Coast and am building a small turbocharged LSA. Therefore, I will mm -hmm. be limited to 10,000 foot of altitude. Are you saying there is not much of an advantage of, to the inclusion of turbo in this scenario? Well, it, it, uh, I assume you're talking about a, like a Rotex 914-915 engine. Um, it it, it kind of depends. Uh, if the engine is, uh, in the case of Rotaxes, I know that the, the, the turbocharged Rotax is rated at higher horsepower. And so, for example, we see turbocharged road taxes on uh, on uh, experimental um, uh, float planes and uh, uh, you know and flying boat type airplanes, um, not because these airplanes are ever going to be at high altitude because most things hardly ever fly over 500 feet, but because they need the extra horsepower. Uh, so the, the use of turbocharging for an LSA would be primarily done um, for because you want the boost to get additional horsepower rather than the, that you want the high altitude performance because you're probably not going to be using it up at high altitude. Nick's wondering, what were the issues seen with the aftermarket intercooler systems? Only that the, the engine puts out more power when the intercooler is installed and the pilot needs to compensate for that. Otherwise, he's going to he, he's going to be running the engine too hard and too hot and causing longevity problems. And the aftermarket intercooler manufacturers have not been very consistent, and the FAA has not been very demanding on them of providing pilots with the necessary data for adjusting their uh, their their performance charts to take into account the addition of the of the intercooler. There are, are some intercooler manufacturers that have been pretty good at providing that kind of data, uh, but there are others that have been notoriously lacking in providing that sort of data. And so, the pilots will install an intercooler. They'll still operate the engine according to the the power charts and the POH, which no longer are accurate. And they'll wind up overstressing the engine and, and causing longevity problems. And I didn't I didn't, didn't really mention intercooling very much, but, but basically, um, when you put air through a compressor to increase its pressure, you also heat it up, and the what an intercooler is, is it's basically a little a radiator uh, that's stuck in the induction system um, at, at the at the compressor discharge to try to cool that heated air back down so that the engine is breathing cool air rather than hot air. Um, and uh, it's good for the engine to breathe cool air, but the cool air is denser and so the engine puts out more power. And so you, so, so if, if the engine was was certificated without a an oil, without a, an intercooler, and you add an intercooler, uh, then all the power charts that you have for that engine aren't aren't any good anymore. They they need to be replaced or adjusted or something. And the problem is with aftermarket intercoolers, often that data that isn't available. Michael's asking. I've never heard the expression "ham-fisted pilots." Could you explain <laughs> it? Did I just make that up? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just you know, pilots that that that, that uh, are are abusive uh, with engines that that you know jamming the throttle in on takeoff or yanking it back to idle um, on descent and um, doing 
things with the mixture control that they shouldn't shouldn't do and that sort of thing. That's kind of what I was, what I was referring to. Jeffrey says, great webinar, Mike. I have a 2017 Cirrus SR22T and Yay. the last yeah, and the last oil change noticed what appeared to be rust coming up through the epoxy paint on the upper side of the lower engine mount tubes. And AMP said it was more likely baked on oils from the heat of the turbo. Have you seen this near the mount location of turbos? Yeah, well, you see all sorts of things with engine mounts, and what you really need to do is 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 clean it up so that you know what you're dealing with. Um, uh it's it's easy for oil to to drip on the engine mount and then get baked by the turbo and look pretty awful but it's also uh sometimes the the case that that uh, engine mounts get heat damage um and that turns out to be a fairly major thing cuz the the engine mount then has to get sent out for weld repairs and it's a major alteration that needs a 337 and stuff or a major repair rather so basically, all I can say is you is you you need to clean the thing up and and find out whether it's just cosmetic or 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 whether it's worse than that. Um, it sounds like what the mechanic is saying is, in his opinion, it's just a cosmetic problem with some coked on oil, and it's quite possible if that's the case. So you're probably in good shape, but you you need to take a close look at it at the next inspection. Lawrence is wondering, how can you tell proactively when it's time to replace or overhaul the turbocharger when engine is mid-time? Well, we, we, I mean, we inspect the turbocharger as, at least once a year at annual, if not more often. And um, it, by visually inspecting the, the turbocharger for any kind of cracking, any kind of evidence of of, of uh, turbine blade scrape uh, in, inside the uh, the turbine housing, and by wiggling the the shaft and and determining if it has free play or not, we can determine the the pretty much all of the condition things that we need to on a turbocharger. the 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 shaft of the of of the turbocharger, which you know is connected to the compressor on one side and the uh, turbine on the other side should have a little bit of axial play and no radial play at all. If it has any radial play, then the center section bearings are shot. And uh, it should spin relatively easily when you spin it with your fingers. And uh, if, if you've looked at them very many times, it, it's pretty obvious whether it whether turbocharger has got a problem or not. Also, we look at it, we, we inspect the turbocharger for uh, for any sort of exhaust leaks that, that are coming out of places that, that, that shouldn't be because the, the, the three sections of the turbocharger kind of bolt together in what's supposed to be an oil tight and exhaust tight set of interfaces. And if, uh, if, exhaust starts es escaping out of one of those interfaces uh, then the turbocharger probably needs to needs to be overhauled alex is wondering what are the normal maintenance issues and intervals for the wastegate um wastegates are actually probably the most problematic component of the system um and what tends to happen with wastegates is that the wastegate again is a, is a is a butterfly it's very much like a throttle but it's it's made out of high temp stainless steel and it's designed to operate at ridiculously high temperatures 1600 degrees or something and um w what tends to happen is that the the bearings that the that that the shaft goes through that that the that the wastegate butterfly pivots on will tend to get all coked up with with exhaust deposits and stuff and the wastegate will then get progressively stickier and stickier it won't want to move easily um and if it gets bad enough it, it starts to cause kind of erratic um operation of the, of the turbocharging system uh, it's particularly noticeable during climbs and descents where the wastegate is supposed to be moving smooth smoothly from 
open towards closed or closed towards open, depending if you're climbing or descending. And it's actually moving in jerks because the the, the bearings are binding. Um, when that's noticed, that normally the first thing you do is you is you saturate the the, the wastegate assembly with a with with a high temperature penetrant. Um, the one that most people use is, is called mouse milk, and it's a penetrating oil. It's designed for high temperature components. If if saturating the wastegate with mouse milk doesn't free up the, the wastegate and doesn't allow it to move smoothly, then the wastegate will probably need to get pulled for, for overhaul. It's actually pretty easy to test the wastegate uh, in the shop. Uh, we disconnect the... the um, the, the oil line from from the engine to the wastegate actuator and we connect uh, a, a source of, of compressed air to it, a shop air with a with a regulator and by varying the air pressure between zero and 50 psi we can exercise the wastegate open and closed uh, we're, we're just operating the actuator using air pressure rather than oil pressure and we can watch it and see if it moves smoothly or whether it, it, it hangs up um, again, if it's hanging up, uh, the first thing you try is to lubricate it. If lubrication fails, then then you have to pull it and send it out for overhaul. Overhauling wastegate's not very expensive. Okay, several people have been asking about um, in-flight failure and best way to handle that. Richard's question kind of sums it up pretty good. Uh, can you comment on the best indicators of in in flight turbo failure and what's the best way to fly the aircraft to landing after a failure without causing further engine damage okay well th there this is a a bit of a controversial subject um first of all if if the tur if a turbocharger fails in flight um it should not be a big deal because the engine reverts to being normally aspirated um and we all know how to fly a normally aspirated airplane <clears throat> um the the problem that has occurred on a number of occasions and the ntsb has made a bunch of noise about this is that if a turbocharger fails and the engine is is running a, a relatively rich mixture um when the turbocharger fails which um, you know drastically reduces the amount of air that the engine can can, can breathe. Um, the mixture may get so rich that the engine will flood out. And restoring power in a situation like that is very simple. You just lean the mixture until the engine runs properly. But the problem is that as pilots, particularly as primary students, we had drilled into our heads that if an engine fails, the first thing you always do is you shove the mixture control all the way forward. And if you have a boost pump, you turn it on. And that's the appropriate thing to do if an engine fails due to, um, due to a fuel system problem. Um, but if, uh, if an engine fails because of a turbocharger, it, it's, it's typically the wrong thing to do. Um, we, we really, if anything, want to lean the, lean the mixture out further um, so that the engine has, an, has a reasonable fuel-air mixture even without the turbo boost, so it's going to need next, less fuel. Um, this doesn't always happen. I've, I've had uh, uh, a turbocharger failure. I had one in, in 2014. It wasn't actually the turbocharger, but I, have a, I had a turbo system failure where the, the, the wastegate went full open and the turbocharger stopped doing anything and my engine reverted to normally aspirated and it and and never missed a beat but but i was cruising at a, a nice lean of peak mixture so i was already pretty lean uh the problem tends to be if you're running a, a, a relatively rich cruise mixture and the turbocharger fails then the mixture may get so rich that the engine flames out and um, correcting that just requires doing the opposite of what your flight instructor told you to do so um, th the way to distinguish whether the engine quit because of a fuel system problem or the engine quit because of a turbocharger problem is pretty simple you look at the fuel flow gauge if the fuel flow has 
gone to zero, it's a fuel system problem. If the f engine's getting lots of fuel and it's not running, um, and, and then you probably look at the manifold pressure gauge and say, hey, that manifold pressure is not what it's supposed to be. It looks kind of like what it would be if this engine wasn't turbocharged. Then you got a turbocharging problem. And the pilot response to those two situations is it should be different. Uh, but there have been some documented accidents um, uh, caused by uh, turbocharger failure where the pilot did uh, went to full rich mixture rather than leaning the mixture. Uh, the engine had a total power loss and, and the airplane crashed. And it, it, I mean, to me, that's just a pilot error thing, but it's a, it, maybe it's a pilot education thing because w when we're primary students, we're taught uh, to, to memorize a set of emergency procedures that are appropriate for normally aspirated airplanes, but may not be always appropriate for turbocharged airplanes. So Patrick's question then is, uh, is mixture control by the pilot any different than in a carbureted engine? Um, well, it's simpler. Um, I mean, if you think about it, in, in a normally aspirated engine, as you climb higher and higher and mother nature reduces manifold pressure, you usually have to reduce fuel flow manually by by leaning progressively as you climb and conversely in a normal aspirated airplane when you descend and manifold pressure increases as you descend you have to add more fuel by enriching the mixture progressively as you descend uh, there are a few normally aspirated airplanes that that have altitude compensating fuel systems that do that for you but the vast majority of them uh, the pilot has to lean in the climb and enriching during descent. In a turbocharged airplane, you don't have to do any of that because the engine thinks it's at sea level. It doesn't. It doesn't know that it's climbing or descending. It doesn't know that it's that it's at flight level one eight zero and not at sea level because the turbocharging system fools it into thinking it's always at sea level, and so you never have to adjust the mixture. And so it's it really greatly simplifies. Um, the pilot workload as far as mixture control is concerned, because it's pretty much a set it and forget it situation. Hmm. Rick's asking, uh, I once noticed my turbo 182 producing a manifold pressure over 32, which was unusual. I reported it to my mechanic and he said it might be over boosting. And if it continues to occur, it would need to be addressed. Could you talk a little bit about over boosting and is it a serious symptom of a problem? Well, first of all, it, uh, I'm surprised your mechanic said it might be overboosting. It, it, it is overboosting by definition. Overboosting means that, that, that the manifold pressure is, is higher than, than, than it's supposed to be, typically higher than redline. Um, so it was overboosting. There's not the question of whether it was or not. Um, overboosting is, uh, something that that happens uh, quite commonly um, if, if somebody applies uh, takeoff power to an engine when the oil is still cool um, because the oil is being used as a hydraulic fluid to control the system and uh, if, if the oil is viscous uh, it, it, it will tend to overboost it also could, could be symptomatic of the turbo controller not being I just got a text from Mike. It says his hotel Wi-Fi just dropped out. He apologizes. And it looks like at this point he's not able to get back online. They got an issue there at the hotel that he's staying at. So I think what we'll do here, folks, is we'll shut her down for the evening. I apologize that uh, we had this technical issue with Mike's uh, internet connection there, but uh, it was nice that we got through his presentation and a good portion of the question and answer. I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight and tuning in. Hope you can join us next week. Have a great night, everybody.